I came to learn pick bill, and I learned pick bill from an authentic source. Yeah, we just we just got back from Sinimtaka. We're in Guatemala City. Some traffic noise here, but uh, it's been quite an adventure. I came to Guatemala to learn pick bill. I think I went right to the source. We went to this small village outside of Coban and. We had to go up and down over mountains with rutted dirt roads, and it was raining, so very muddy, but lots of fog, and I loved seeing all the mountains peeking through the fog. Felt like way out in the middle of nowhere, and come to this woman's house. Very small, humble house, dirt floors, corrugated iron roofing. Molly is welcome to me with great hospitality. Molly has helped me set right some of the things that I had done with the warp I prepared to learn from. Turns out pick bill warps are very specific. I set my warp up in a way that is typical of other Guatemalan weaving. So, first day we had some fixing to do. So, first day we had some fixing to do. We needed to take the threads and starch them. And what they did was to take tortillas, three tortillas and some hot water, and mix them up together and rub those tortillas into a fine gruel. and just put the threads right down in there and worked them around. Pulled them out. And allowed them to dry. Of course, it was a rainy day and there was no sun to dry them in. They actually brought some burning sticks off of the fire and set them up, piled them up underneath my loom right there in the house. And I was surprised how much heat that caused. It actually did really speed up the drying of the warp.
Does it know why it came out? No. no. Got all the threads arranged, made a heading at one end, and then we needed to turn the loom around and weave from the other end. So I think our first day was mostly preparing and setting up the loom. We wove a little bit, a little bit of a heading in there. It's a good thing I've woven with a backstrap loom before. I've had many years experience weaving on a traditional Western European loom that has um, what they call harnesses that control the threads and you have pedals to stand on. And they raise and lower different threads and then you can throw your weft across with a shuttle. A backstrap loom is very, very simple. There are no pedals. There are your threads. They are tied around the waist at one end and tied to a post or somewhere on the wall at the other end. And there are a number of different sticks that go across to control the movement of the threads. But the most important one, the chakoi, it's a long stick that has a continuous thread. It runs from the chakoi under a warp thread and then back up to the chakoi and then it skips and goes under the third warp thread and back around the chicoy under the fifth warp thread, all the way across. I think there were more than 100 warp threads. Mm -hmm. You get a nice four to six inch space in between the threads that are down and the threads that are up for me to pass my thread through. On a backstrap loom, you pull, I'm pulling as hard as I can on this little stick, and I'm seeing this little space opening up. And I have to slide my sword through, and it's very easy to capture a thread that's supposed to be down and make it go up. And my teacher was, oh, no, 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 correcting me, pulling it out, doing it again. A few years ago, I had the good fortune to work with um, a woman in the United States, from a Maya woman from um, Guatemala, and, and do some backstrap weaving. So fortunately, I had a little experience, because I remember how overwhelming that first experience was, trying to make these openings. And your body is actually part of the loom when you do backstrap weaving. You, for one shed, when you're pulling up the chikoi, you need to lean forward and put a little bit of slack into the warp so that you can actually pull those threads up. And then the other shed is, we call it a shed, it's the opening between the threads. When you want to lift the other threads up, you pull down on a bar, the threads are rolling over the bar, and so it pulls the space towards you. You need some tension, so you need to lean back and put a little more tension when you do, when you do that pass. And so there's sort of a constant, um, you get a feel for, um, for your threads. You're kind of manipulating them all the time with the movements of your body. So the second day, we started working on the designs and mm -hmm. Amalia asked me, you know, what, what pattern would you like to make? And she showed me a piece of weaving and had they have all kinds of, of beautiful patterns, little people and ducks. Someone I really like said, oh, this Australia, I would like to make this star, that's beautiful. Turns out I chose one of probably the most difficult, a little more complicated, had more threads. And my sample loom I had made fairly wide because I really wanted to be able to make a weak out. And it turns out the width take more time. And um, it was counting. You count all the little threads. So the challenge for me, the biggest challenge for me, was my eyesight. This is an art for young eyes. And we were indoors on a misty, rainy day. There was very little light. Did have my reading glasses. but. The, all the threads are white and they're so fine. They're as fine as sewing thread and they're so close together. And I'm supposed to count 10 up and three down and 10 more up. <laughs> and, I, and I was trying. Uh, a key. A key? Si. Si. Oh, a key. No, a key. And say, Ocho, Ocho. 
<laughs> can't you count? <laughs> and for me, yes, I can count, but I can't see. It was the problem. In the afternoon, we opened the door, and the sun came out a little. It went a little better for me to um, be able to see. But the first design, the first day I worked on a design, I think I got five inches, and it took about five and a half hours. And we asked, how long would that take you? Maybe an hour. Not quite an hour. Taxing, very taxing on the body. The eyes and the back and holding position and shifting your weight and um, some beginner's tension too, I think. I was pretty tired that night. Amalia kindly gave me um, a stool to sit on. It was about eight inches high off the ground. So um, that was actually much easier than how most Mayan women uh, weave is to kneel right on the ground and, um, and sit that way all day. I think that would have been really difficult for me. But it you put the belt for, uh, around, it's called a back strap, but it actually goes much lower kind of on the hips. You're there for the duration. <laughs> if you need to get up, you're going to have to take off your whole loom. Amazing thing, too, is that all of these sticks are placed in the perfect place. They have to go under one thread, over one thread. If they fall out, it will be hours replacing them. They gave me a kind of like a little baby safety harness. It was a piece of yarn that was tied around each end of the stick and went over the thread so that if I tipped and the stick slipped, it would get caught by those threads and we wouldn't lose the whole thing. Um, but these women weave and, um, and talk and they set it down and they pick it up again and these sticks are just lying in the right place and they, they don't fall out. I don't know how they do it. I was um, working for many hours, and family life's going on around me. There's um, four or five children. One of the, the little girl, the first day, was pretty sick. She was lying in bed and coughing all day, and um, felt bad for her. There's also a little baby who's adorable, Amalia, caring for her baby and coming and going. There were chickens wandering in and out. At one point, a chicken hopped up on the bed and kind of settled down, and down later and there was an egg there. Started working on my star design, Astraea. Pit bill is different from other types of Maya weaving. The threads that go up and down are the warp threads and in many forms of Maya weaving, those are the most important threads, those are the ones that you see the most. The weft is smaller and they pack very, very tightly until you can hardly see the weft at all. Really, the warp threads are the, are the color, and, they're, and they're, it's a very dense cloth. Pickpill is 180 degrees opposite. It's sheer and gossamer-like. Um, very, very fine white threads, and they are set with space in between them in the warp. And then when you weave, you bring the um, espalda down very gently so that you leave a little tiny space in between each thread and it makes a transparent cloth. That's your background cloth. Then the designs are placed in using brocade. They make a heavier thread by taking three of the same white cotton threads that they use for the background and stringing them together. And they slide this under a certain number of threads and then in, they do a row of their background weaving and then they slide that brocade thread in the other direction for a certain number of threads and then another row of background weaving and so it's as if they're um, trapping the design thread the thicker design thread kind of on the surface and um, it's white on white so it's very it's very beautiful it's very subtle um, but to make these patterns and designs you it's very mathematically based you need to know um, how many threads you have across the width, you need to know how many threads your design is going to, to take so that you can decide how many designs you can fit across the width. And then at the beginning of the design, you need to, uh, there's a certain number of threads to start that first row, and then you count the distance before you start the first row of your second design, and then you count the distance all the way across. Your second row has a different number of threads, maybe to the right a little bit, or to the left a little bit, or a little wider, a little narrower, and this way they build they build their patterns. It was kind of interesting being a beginner. I haven't been a beginner in a long time. <laughs> it's humbling. I got very proud. By, by, I finished my Estrella, and then I learned to make 
um, little patos, or as um, the little girl told me, the next day she was feeling much better. She was up and about playing with the baby, and she told me, patoosh, patoosh. And um, that is the Kekchi word for duck. And so I learned to make a patoosh. And that was a simpler design, so that, that went easier and quicker. Um, and then I saw another design I really loved, and started in learning on that one, Ojas de Pacaya, which looks a little like palm fronds. I feel pretty good. I'm picking up speed. It's not taking me five hours to do three inches anymore. I'm picking up a little speed. Being able, by the, by the third day, I could see those threads. I think I had a brighter day, and um, I started to be able to tell. You can watch these pick the weavers go across, and this is their speed as they're, they're pulling their different design threads, and their row is done. <laughs> Each one I'm pulling one, two, three, no, that's wrong. One, two, three, start again. So I started, I noticed they don't actually have to count every single thread. They can see, they can look, they know their designs by heart. And they're, 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 they're knowing that they're, they're going to need to pick up two threads to the right of their last row and finish two threads to the left or something like that. And I started being able to do that a little more, be able to see. But there were still times where Amalia would go, oh, no, no, and back me up and pull them out for me and, and show me start here and there. When I was done for the day and I looked at Amalia's weaving, I had so much more respect. I've thought this pick was beautiful since the moment I saw it, but I had so much more respect after weaving it myself. Amalia's threads are exactly, perfectly, evenly spaced in the warp and the weft. And, and when the design occurs, all the threads around it continue parallel. In my designs, it's very easy to pull a little bit too tight on one side or the other when you turn your brocade thread and that brings all your warp threads in and they look nicely spaced till they got to the design and then they started coming in a little bit and then they went out a little bit and um, also the edges they're called selvages and it is every weaver's pride to learn to have perfect selvages and it is the mark of a good weaver probably around the world because I noticed that all of the best Weavers in Guatemala have perfectly even selvages. They take a little hollow, like a little hollow reed, and something sharp. I've seen them use thorns. I've also seen them use nails, so little bits of wire. Um, and they capture a couple of edges on the, the side of the weaving, and they catch it with a nail, put the nail into the hollow reed, and that reed goes across, and they capture the other side, and that stretches. It helps keep it nice and straight and even. But mine, and you have to move that every half inch or so, whenever I moved mine, my side threads where the little nail had gone through were just bloop, <laughs> just stretched out. And then for an inch it would come in and then it would stretch out again. And I just kept looking at my selvages and going, oh, I'm so proud of my selvages usually, but I have to concentrate on learning this new method and then I'll get my selvages perfect later. For Maya woman, weaving is part of her identity as a person to be to learn to be a good weaver. They they begin learning as children, maybe eight or nine years old, and they continue weaving in, until they can't see their friends anymore. Um, all of their life, this is something that can be picked up and put down again um, among all of the other household duties. The baby's crying, you can set it down. They can't, I can't, or my little. Sticks fall out, but they get good at it. can set it down, go and cook, come back, they have some free time, they can weave for half an hour, and maybe the baby wakes up and they set it down again. Um, this tradition of weaving wipiles and, and other items too, but particularly the wipiles are the uh, clothing that the women wear that really identify them as far as their their region and their cultural identification. And this tradition has been passed down, mother to daughter, through so much strife. Colonization, and more recently, in several decades past, terrible civil war, where people were driven out of their villages and into the hills, with, and they, they, were not, they were not able to bring their looms. They weren't able to bring their cooking pots. The fact that these people survived, and then that this, their cultural traditions have survived, their, their native languages, their foods, and then these weavings. 
The Maya culture has persisted through through so much, and now another pressure that's upon it is the encroaching dominant world culture, um, dominant Western culture. Uh, it's kind of amazing to see people with their dirt floors and their backstrap looms tied to the wall, stopping to answer a phone call on their cell phone. <laughs> and the roads that were so difficult for us, they are working very hard to improve. And in some of these villages, they proudly told us, you know, next time you come, our road will be no more mud. That's very good. That's very good for the people. And I'm just hopeful that as the people enjoy progress and more of the um, amenities of modern life, that the Maya woman is able to continue to persevere and hold on to the, this tradition, to the traditions of their languages, the traditions of their, their spiritual beliefs, their food, the way they raise their children, and their weaving.